Our first presenter comes from very, very not far away. Uh, he's the head librarian of the Alaska State Library Historical Collection. It's a wonderful resource, which is getting a lot of use, but I still feel is underutilized, particularly by the Native community. And that's another agenda here is to get folks to come over to the collection. I spent a month, two years ago, in the collection. And uh, first of all, it was a lot of fun, nice people. Wonderful, very friendly and helpful, but also there are treasures there um, and sometimes hidden in, in small little gold nuggets in various collections. And so Jim is going to talk about highlights of the various collections of photographs that pertain to Flingit, I assume. Um, before coming Becoming the head of the li librarian of this wonderful collection, he received his Master of Fine Arts from Utah State in set design and theater technology. He co-founded with Dave Hansaker uh, the Nakahidi Theater in 86. He's really a theater man and a film. He contributed to film and theater projects throughout the United States, including many projects involving Alaska Native people. So he wears many hats. He's also a journeyman carpenter and uh, has a master's in library and information science from University of Illinois. So we've, uh, we didn't have to really drag him here. He was very happy to come and join us on this session. Please welcome Jim Samart. Gunas Cheech, thank you for inviting me to, uh, to speak to you. I, um, want to just show you a, um, a few pictures from our collections. And as Sergei said, and invite you to come and do research at the library. We have about a half a million photographs in, in the library. We've made every effort to put them online in Alaska's digital archives, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Uh, if you're not, you should go and, and look. But we have in the digital collections of about 10,000 of those half million. So uh, we're doing our best and we're, we've, uh, we're gonna keep working on it, but you really have to come in and look at the photographs. We also have, have um, uh, collection descriptions that have inventories and I'll show you at the end of this how you can uh, find those. What I want to do is just uh, look at a, a few of the uh, photographers, uh, photographers that have created significant collections that, uh, that depict um, the Alaska um, Native communities in Southeast uh, beginning about the turn of the century. And uh, I'm going to start with Winter and Pond, the, who had a successful business for about 50 years here in Juneau. Um, they've created what really are uh, many of the iconic images that I'm sure you all know. Um, of the Clinket communities, particularly in the um, northern southeast. These beautiful images are all from uh, Clock Juan. Uh, Winter and Pond uh, were um, given access to a lot of um, important events in important places. They were, uh, were commercial photographers, but actually made their living for the most part uh, working for the mining industry and they dabble a little bit in mining themselves. This is Chief Johnson down in uh, just south of uh, Gino, the Taku Chief. So these photographs have been uh, widely seen and uh, widely published. There are, are about 3,000 glass plate negatives that we have in the, in the library. Many of them have not been seen and really do deserve more research. Uh, Elbridge Merrill, any of you from Sitka are going to be familiar with, with Mr. Merrill's work. He, um, he was from a prominent Boston family, came to Sitka, and, uh, and never left. He made his, his home in Sitka, and, and um, wh one of the things that Mr. Merrill liked to do is take pictures of himself. Uh, here's one is uh, sitting on the rock, which uh, now has a plaque with his face on it. Uh, I think some people call it Merrill Rock. And he also had a successful business in, in Sitka for many years. He was uh, kind of the official photographer of uh, Sheldon Jackson College and, and did many of these uh, group photos. Uh, this one uh, 
I've taken from a, uh, a print that's on a, a kind of a rough fiber paper. Uh, you'll see, I wanted you to get a sense of the kind of detail that's in these photographs. Uh, they're really fabulous records. This is the uh, shoe repair shop there at uh, Sheldon Jackson, or the SICA training school at the time. He also um, did the coverage that's uh, so well known of the 1904 potlatch. These also are, are incredibly well detailed photographs. Uh, the PowerPoint does not do this technology justice. This is a wonderful little model of the uh, uh, of the chapel. I, there's a man there with a, a square. I presume he's the master builder. This is, uh, does anyone recognize this photograph? It's uh, Jack Watson, who was uh, at an Athabascan, and his wife, uh, Mary James, or uh, Sheep Creek Mary. Uh, they were trading partners. And their, uh, their son, James Watson, uh, was one of the founders of the AMB, and their, their great-grandson is uh, my good friend Sorrel Goodwin, who's the uh, uh, registrar at the State Museum now. This beautiful portrait is the uh, uh, linguistic uh, genius uh, Dakina, who was one of the living librarians, uh, libraries that uh, uh, Robert Bringhurst was speaking about the other day, who, who told um, Clinkett literature through uh, Don Cameron to, uh, to John Swanton in 1904, and he sang dozens of songs into John Swanton's little uh, wax cylinder recording, and they still exist. I, I know they're, they're played pretty widely around Southeast Alaska. So now I'm gonna move from these two real successful and polished uh, commercial photographers to, um, to this couple. This is David and uh, Mary Wagner, who were Presbyterian missionaries. They came to Klawak in 1900. Now, last summer, their, uh, their granddaughter, uh, Charlotte Statlander, uh, made a trip to Alaska um, to, uh, to bring this collection. And um, these are things that haven't been seen in public. And they're mostly in Klawak, we think. It's not a well-documented collection. We really need people from the region to, uh, to look at these photographs. But they're mostly, what I'm going to show you are portraits. Here's the Klawak. So I'm just going to run through these and let you see them. I find these photographs interesting because technically they're, uh, they have troubles, they're not good, but as portraits they're fabulous. So the Wagoners were in uh, Klawak for 14 years until 1914 when they were transferred and ran the Presbyterian Church here in, uh, in Juneau. Isn't that happy looking little baby? Here are a few uh, little community portraits that he did. And they did travel quite a bit uh, up and down Lincoln Canal and uh, around Southeast. I don't know where these villages are. I'd like to, if anybody recognizes the places. Kill us new. And then in 1914, they came to uh, uh, Juneau, where they stayed until 1940, when the church was taken over by this handsome couple, uh, Walter Sobolov, of course. I wanted to show you some, some portraits from uh, Fuki Kayamori. Uh, any of you from Yakutat, I'm sure, are, are familiar with Kayamori. He was uh, a Japanese cannery worker and an amateur photographer. Um, 
Paul Jackson told me that as a child he remembered going to Kaimori's house, and Kaimori was a kind man. He always had some sweet rice that the children liked to, to eat. And, uh, and I, he, uh, he raised, uh, raised and trained in dogs. Apparently it was one of the things that he did for a living. And I believe it was George Ramos who told me that his, his father had bought some trained dogs from, from Kaimori. And uh, he did these beautiful uh, portraits. He'd come to uh, Yakutat in 1912 and he made his home there for the rest of his life. And then because he was Japanese, the, uh, the day after Pearl Harbor, Rather than be arrested, he took his own life. Then there's this collection. Um, each of these collections, I'm, uh, are, they're large, they're huge, and um, uh, there's, there's plenty of good information to be found in. Trevor Davis uh, was a um, photographer who was born into uh, a Juno family. Um, he started taking uh, pictures around 1912 and um, took photos around this area all the rest of his life until 1959. This is the Huna fire and the aftermath. Uh, his wife was uh, Carol Berry Davis, who wrote the uh, uh, second verse of the Alaska flag song. And also recorded and published um, uh, Clinkett music. Um, and there's a, um, a collection of, sing of uh, Clinkett songs that she um, uh, recorded that I've never heard. I know Library of Congress has them, and I don't know if they're widely known or not. This is the uh, old village up to Kotaku. So I'm going to leave with, with this guy. This is Edward Kaiton, who um, spent. Um, much of his life in southeast Alaska was the, uh, the curator of the uh, State Historical Library and Museum uh, starting, I think, about 1944, uh, something like that, and was a curator for a long time. What's happening here in this picture, uh, and I don't know who these other men are, I'd like to, uh, is they're uh, making a movie. They're out by the Mendenhall uh, Lake and they're shooting some kind of a film. Uh, we, we've investigated and have no idea what the film was. Maybe it still exists. But he, um, he and his wife were, uh, were teachers, uh, lived in, uh, in uh, Wrangell, lived in Shishmaref, and he has a, a large collection of photographs that he's left from the Wrangell Institute. Uh, and he was very interested in uh, contemporary arts and, and crafts, uh, so there's a, a lot of... Uh, of documentation of, of people from Wrangell. So that's all I'm going to show you. Uh, if you haven't yet visited Alaska's digital archives, do. And um, there, there's, uh, I should tell you, this is a collaborative project that the State Library does with the university and Anchorage and Fairbanks and several other institutions. Um, you can visit our website where there's good contact information. You can get uh, uh, full text descriptions of uh, our photo collections, and you can contact us if you need any help in your research. Thank you. I'd like to do something differently as chair and moderator. Um, if you have any questions to Jim, ask them now because uh, leaving questions to the end doesn't work. People leave and drift in and out. So any questions to Jim about the collection? Going once, going twice. Yes. Um, all the glass plates that you mentioned, are they generally, are there a print of them or is it hard to get in and handle? Generally, generally there are. The, uh, the Winter of Pond uh, photographs, there are 3,000 uh, plates. Those were all uh, printed some time ago by Ron Klein, uh, good contact prints. The, uh, the, uh, the plates that Sergei is going to talk about from the Vince Sobolev collection, there are 
500. About 500. There were not prints from many of those. And there are a lot. Uh, they've, they've since been uh, not printed but digitally imaged uh, uh, on Sergei's request. We do a lot of the imaging work we do by request. So if there are some materials you want to see, come in and uh, you know, we'll, we'll dig through the stuff. There are lots of negatives in our vault that, that are unprinted. Um, nitrate negatives that have been in the freezer for decades. So uh, we're, we're constantly working on getting these things printed, but no, they're not. Yeah, mention that it's available online, some this, of the images. Yes, this one here, the, the URL is, is uh, Vilda. V-I-L-D-A, which actually used to mean virtual library and digital archives, dot Alaska dot edu. And then from, this, from the state website um, here, there's a, uh, there's a link um, up in, in this upper right-hand corner that says uh, Alaska's uh, digital archives. Also, if any of you use uh, SLED, that's a library uh, database, there's a link from, from SLED. And you can actually search. So if you're in a hurry and you need, you can search Katlian and something will come up, or Sitka, St. Michael Cathedral, and you can get 15 images of St. Michael, whatever's been put on online. So for PowerPoint presentation or, or things, you know, and the library puts more and more online, so it's really useful. Um, you can see images of people. Um, I find it very useful for teaching, you know, right before class, you know, I want to show them something, you know, what did Noam look like in 1900, and you can quickly find out. A lot of these photographs speak to us if we are able to interview people who remember the individuals, the places, the activities that take place. Um, the other thing is that photographs are often misidentified. In the case of uh, Sobler photographs, the glass plates that he left behind, he died in 1950, um, they were sort of sitting in his store in Angoon and eventually were discovered by his nephew, Kinky Bears, and we all Kinky Bears, you know, a lot of gratitude, so he brought them and eventually they found their way into the Alaska State Library. But Kinky Bears identified them to the best of his ability and, and on the plates there, I think, writing by Kinky Bears. But some of them, the writing is, is a bit odd. He, for example, refers to clan houses as dance houses. Uh, he sometimes refers to Angoon as kill snow. So uh, some of the mistakes are so obvious it's, it's sort of laughable. But sometimes he misidentifies people and so forth. So he knew something about, he actually knew quite a bit about Southeast Alaska, but he didn't live in the same era as his uncle. So you have to correct those mistakes. And through interviews with hopefully more than one individual, you kind of triangulate, you know, and do things. And even when sometimes Native people identify certain individuals, I've, through my early research with Merrill photographs, I found that uh, really interesting mistakes when an, a younger native person would say, oh, this is photograph was taken in the basement of St. Michael Cathedral, and he's referring to a Merrill photograph taken in 1900. There was no basement in St. Michael's Cathedral until after the fire, which was in the 1960s. So the idea that, you know, the oral tradition is always right, that some of our younger native colleagues have, is also a bit uh, simplistic, if you pardon me. So. You have to kind of work back and forth between the oral and written, between the elders and the other scholars, and sort of do the best you can. In my case, I was very fortunate because I began the study of the Russian church uh, history in Tlingit country in 1979-80, and at that time a lot of the elders were still alive. And in Angoon, that meant people like Jimmy George Sr., Lydia George, who I really hope would be in this um, session with us, but unfortunately she's no longer with us. Uh, but they taught me a lot about the church and that information along with some other elders, uh, their information went into my book Memory Eternal. And I used St. Vincent's photographs there, uh, the, more, the better known ones, uh, because he took some pictures of the church scenes since his father was a priest in Angoon and Kilisno. Um, 
but that was just the beginning. I also combined uh, information about the parish and the native community from his father's church records, all written in Russian, uh, that were available. They're, they're all in the United States, but you have to know the Russian language, obviously. So this kind of combination of written sources, photographs, and interviews with descendants of the people that he's writing about, I think that's how, um, of course, it's not the only way to work with historic photographs, but I think it's one of the most productive ways. So this is what I'm getting at. And I think if I had been working on this project 30 years ago, it would have been better, but you know, I had other, <laughs> other things to do. So, um, but I'm going back to my old field notes, and um, luckily, um, Walter Sobolev is still here, and I was trying to get him to come here, but he's so involved in watching the basketball at the gold tournament that, and his whole family is, so it's impossible to get him. <laughs> because v Vita, Vitali, Vincent, was his true uncle, father's brother. And I was amazed that we don't have interviews with Walter about his family, at least not in the record. And it's interesting that, you know, the Alaska Heritage Institute, they've interviewed Walter repeatedly about Tlingit culture, but not about his family. So um, when I was here in 2006, I'd sit in uh, Jim's, uh, in the archive, but then grab a cab and drive out in the valley and, and talk to Walter and show him the photographs. And he remembers a lot. So there'll be some pictures that he identified um, the people in, and, and even homes in, in um, Hillesnum. Okay, so very briefly, um, Father Sobolev was born in Russia, and on the left you see him as a young man, and on the right he and his wife, Olga Lutke, who was of German, Polish, possibly Jewish background. Um, he came here uh, with a Russian Orthodox choir, actually, to San Francisco, and it's a long story, we're not gonna go into it. I can tell you a lot of stories, but he was sort of stuck in the United States and he did have some clerical background, as in clergy. And so decided to go into um, that profession and he didn't have really any money to go back to Russia. He had a beautiful uh, boss voice, sang well, but kind of wandered around and eventually ends up in the San Francisco Russian Orthodox Cathedral in the late 18, 18, in 1880s. Becomes a deacon and eventually is ordained. Uh, he marries this woman he meets in, in San Francisco area who, um, what you see is just the top part. And these are pictures that were on the wall in the Sobolev home in Kilsnu. Um, they had a whole arrangement of photographs from their early days that their son Vincent took a picture of. So it's a picture of a picture. And this is a studio portrait of Olga who was quite pretty. Everybody commented on her blue eyes. And a kind of a studio portrait taken in Anaheim, California where her family ends up eventually uh, in a gorgeous so Victorian dress. And uh, her family starts out fairly poor. They're sort of Polish-German immigrants. And, but then they are the founders of German Anaheim colony of uh, people involved in vineyards and wine growing and so forth. So they're not poor at all. And I, I wonder what they thought about this Russian deacon guy, you know, who marries them. What is going on? So anyway, he's marrying her, she converts to his religion, and he takes her to his first assignment, which is in Kilisno, and Kilisno is kind of uh, in the middle of nowhere as far as her family is concerned. And they live there. Walter remembers his grandma singing German songs to him, so I guess that was her first language. Uh, but it's interesting that her first name was Olga, which is Russian, so there's some kind of a Russian-German connection. She was a little younger than him. Oopsie. So some photographs from the Mac do not show on these PCs. All right. Uh, and why kill a snow? Uh, the home of the, the Kutsnu people, of course, is Angoon. 
And in the late 19th century, there are other major villages like Whitewater Bay area and several others around Admiralty. But gradually, they sort of congregate into Angoon as their major community. And that's where trade with Euro-Americans takes place, and even before that with Russian Americans. And across the channel, the Northwest Trading Company builds in the 1887, I believe, its first trading posts. And, be, and it's a Portland-based company that gets into um, whaling and herring processing. And there's a lot of herring and their whales in Chatham Straits, if, if you know the area. Um, the previous picture is actually not from the Sobolev collection. The nice thing about uh, the historical library that you can, you know, you can do search by Kilisnu, and every th picture that has Kilisnu would come up through the search. And if Vincent's pictures begin later in the 90s, so I could find other photographs of the same place earlier, taken earlier and later. And there's some better photographs where you could see the company store with actually the words, the, the letters NWCO, Northwest Trading Company. But anyways, this is what the village settlement looked like in the late 90s, early 1900s. And again, I don't have a lot of time, but uh, towards the point which is looking, if you've been to Angoon, the, the point is what you see when you arrive on the ferry. So it's the, the part of the island that's looking towards Angoon, towards the sort of, I don't want to say mainland, but the larger island. And that was considered the Indian village. But some of the homes, like this big house, Walter Sobolev said that was built by Eddie Jim, who's one of the, the big Tlingit leaders. And that's a very substantial home. And closer to the water was the, the white people's settlement. And uh, this is the public school. The Russian church is not visible, so this was probably taken before it got established in the, I think, 1890. I'm a little tired, I'm blanking on the dates. But uh, there are enough pictures of this town taken by Vincent before he took the picture after that you can do a nice kind of a little historical reconstruction and, and I do have some um, data from Walter, although he couldn't remember all the buildings. The village burned down in 1928, so to get a person who remembers the actual building, they have to be pretty elderly by now. Even Lydia, who was born in 1922, she was six years old when it burned down, so she didn't remember it. She could only tell me what her older relatives told her about Kellison. But Jimmy George, her husband, who was born 30 years earlier than she was, he certainly remembered it very well. Here's a, oops, what is going on? This is taken by Kaysen Draper, another well-known couple of photographers. So you have different images. And of course, to the left, uh, our company, um, company uh, buildings and so forth, stores, post office. Uh, what is really interesting is how the Sobolevs tried to maintain a kind of Russian-American lifestyle. And I did, you know, with a lot of enlargements, you can try to see what they had in their home. I was really interested in the books, for example, with the Russian and um, English. Uh, I mean, they had portraits of the Tsar and, and the Empress. Nicholas II and Alexandra, which is obviously Father Sobolev's thing, icons. They're looking at photography because Vincent, the older boy, received a Kodak camera as a birthday gift um, when he was a teenager. And, and that's really the, why we have the, the pictures. He was not a professional, but he clearly loved taking pictures. And I think the fact that he was not a professional, he didn't stage his pictures most of the time. He just sort of walked around the area and, and snapped a lot of pictures. Sometimes he had his younger sisters and other kids, uh, their playmates and native kids, um, sort of pose. And some adult Tlingit people allowed them, him to photograph them. So they trusted him because he was 
the priest's boy and uh, they lived side by side. They were not part of the same community, but he was not a stranger. So the relationship was definitely different from uh, the relationship that, let's say, Wintern Pond had, who had a studio in Juneau. And it different from Merrill, who had pretty good rapport with the Sitkatlinga people, but he was not part of the community. This is, uh, they're not, he's not a Tlingit boy with a camera, but at least he's a kind of local boy with a camera. So there's some really interesting issues here. So anyway, they have clocks, you know, and yet think about it, they have no running water, no electricity, yet their mother dresses them up in really uh, great clothing. This is just later on when, when uh, the father dies in 1908. By that time, um, Vincent, uh, he's running mail locally. And in 1912, apparently, Sobolev Company, I think it's his, with some help from his brother Alexander, the younger brother. They have a little store and a little business in Kilisnu. And I found this among the papers. It's not part of the photographic collection. There's a book that you have called the, the business cards. And, yeah, and this is really interesting. So we know what it was called. Gasoline boats. Uh, Vincent was very much into boats. And there are pictures of him with his boat and so forth. And he was a postman. So this is good. And this is Vincent's later business. And it's what he built in Angoon. And, and he had that almost until the end of his life. So people remembered that. In fact, this is the property that's now owned by Matthew Kukash and Jackie. And in the later years, he had a movie theater there, a little one where he showed films. And uh, people remembered, you know, going there to buy stuff, and, you know, kids bought candy. And he was kind of a tough guy. I, it's, I heard that he would post names of people who owed him a lot of money and didn't pay. So, uh, But again, he was not of the community fully, but he was not a total stranger either. And this, this I know exactly what the spot is, so in fact, I think uh, Matthew and Jackie were talking about, you know, maybe building something there and so forth. So it was a nice home. His brother Sasha is interesting, of course, because he is the father of Walter, and he is the one who marries into a Tlingit family. And he dies much younger, age 30. This is my favorite picture. It's really lovely. And his wife was Anna Hunter of the... On Haki Tan clan, the dog salmon. And I don't know who the other lady is, and Walter didn't know. Uh, but I just admire the, how lovely they're dressed. And just very nice, good looking ladies. And I, I have a lot of information on Walter's family, but I'm not going to go into that. Now, on the other hand, there were two sisters Nina, the younger one. Vera, the oldest. And then I discovered that there was a Creole girl, or the Russian girl, probably Aliud, called Nelly Stepanov, which is definitely a Russian name, but Aliud. If there are other pictures of her. If you look closer, she has some, like, Aleutic Aliud features. So Sobolev's adopted several local kids who probably were orphans or didn't have a stable family situation. And those names also show up in church records for Kilosnus. So you can clearly see that there was, um, the family had more than just the, so the four Sobolev kids. And the fact that this girl uh, appears in all the pictures, they're always the three girls, uh, means that they were family. This is the priest's home, which was a tiny house right next to the church. This is my favorite picture. I mean, it does have a certain mood. And, you know, Sasha and Vita are the big boys, so they don't play with these, but Vita is taking their pictures. So you have the three girls. Pay attention to this boy, the second one from the left. Not only because he's very sort of cute, but uh, he's going to be very important in a minute here. I don't know who the other boy is. I know exactly who this boy is. He's at least part Tlingit, so he's going to be very important. This is a great story, and I figured it all out. Why are they dressed in kimonos? And obviously, they're much older here. Now, they're late teens. There was a shipwreck uh, of a Japanese ship, and these sailors were stuck. Uh, the ship was called Hatsumaru. 
it was described in some newspaper accounts and the sailors were treated well um, this was not long after the Russian Japanese war so the girl's father was father Sobolev was not very happy because Russia fought Japan but he was a kind man so you fed them and basically some of them stayed and maybe some of the there are some Japanese families in Angun with I mean, some Japanese names but in any way they gave uh, kimonos to the family and there's even one picture where Alexander Sobolev Walter's dad is dressed in a kimono and they had a lot of fun, you know, sort of fooling around and so forth. And here the mothers dressed them up as ladies. Fortunately, they, they chose to marry two Irish uh, fishermen. And I think in terms of social class, it wasn't like really high class marriage, but nonetheless. And here's, Vera had six children. One of them was Pinky Bears, the only boy, you see that? And he's famous as a local Juno historian and kind of a captain and, and he saved the plates and Nina is the one behind the younger one I think she had some kids but not as many and this is a great picture of Vincent in his later years with with all his nieces and one nephew I mean this is pretty good quality I think for I don't know who was taking the picture but it's a great photograph um, the interesting thing that happened and I got a little bit of this from Walter is that there was a sort of a split, and you get a little bit of that. Um, Vera, in later years, in the 50s, published a memoir, like a three-part article in the Alaska Sportsman magazine about her life. She chooses a different last name. For some reason, she calls herself Vera Ivanov, although anybody in Juno could figure out it was Vera Sobolev. But she talks about her childhood, her father. But there's like no mention of Alexander's marriage to, marriage to a Tlingit lady. And then Walter, I asked Walter, did you, s your family, socialize with your aunts? And he said, not really. So I think there was like a split. So because his father married into a Tlingit family. And then he died, and, and his, Walter's mother remarried. But I had a feeling Walter being kind, man, he didn't want to say anything about this. Or, but there wasn't much of a family connection with the, with the Russian-American side. All right, here's, I figured this out, more or less. Um, in the church records, the boy was called Cyril Sobolev. But then he goes to school in Sitka, and at some point he changes his name to Cyril Zuboff, and of course there's a whole big Zuboff family in Angoon. And they all trace their lineage to a Russian named Joseph Zuboff. And Joseph Zuboff is a name that, you know, there's Joseph Zuboff the first, the second, the third, and the current Joseph Zuboff the fourth is Joey Zuboff, who many of us know is the head of the Raven House. Joseph Zubov, and again, I, I'm the one who's really running over time here, but it's a very interesting story. Joseph Zubov was a Russian who uh, comes to America in the 80s and eventually finds his way to kill Snow. He was one of the managers of the business there, of the company. And he fathers a number of children with Tlingit women. He has that sort of reputation. Uh, the Father Sobolev calls him the biggest rooster on Kill Snow Island. But he kind of recognizes some of his kids, but still, clearly, the boy spends his time with he, both the Tlingit kids. This is a great picture. This is, again, Cyril Zuboff with two Tlingit boys. And I really like the fact that Vincent took a lot of pictures of children, <laughs> that you don't get constant pictures of chiefs or clan leaders dressed in regalia and very stoic. It's just sort of ordinary scenes. But he also, you know, he's part of the Sobolev family because he plays with the Sobolev family members. Um, but there's one picture where the little boy, Cyril, is with a man who, I mean, he's holding his hand very tightly 
and these are all white men, why would he be standing with some guy who's holding a gun and holding his hand? So again, this is my speculation. It could be his biological father. And what we know is that later in life, he assumes his last name Zubov. He drops his sort of foster family name Sobolev. And in 1911, he goes to Seattle to be with his father who dies of some, who had some terrible, maybe cancer, I don't know. And uh, Zubov shoots himself in the Seattle hotel room. There's a big article in the Seattle newspaper in 1911. So, and uh, much later in life, uh, Cyril Zubov is, he chooses to identify as a Lincoln. Um, and I've actually tried, you know, there's this whole very useful website, ancestry.com, so you can look at um, records of, you know, baptism and s census records, basically. He is identified as mixed Russian. At some point, he begins to be identified as Indian. So the census takers are not clear sure who he is or whether he identifies, self-identifies as white, Indian, mixed. But anyway, eventually he becomes quite prominent in local politics. He's the grand president. Um, his Tlingit name was Each Day, which is your name, right? He was Killer Whale. Um, and he subsequently marries a Tlingit woman. And so, um, but you could see that, that he's got, you know, Caucasian as well as Tlingit ancestry, I think. And he writes a letter not long before his death to uh, a Russian researcher uh, in the Library of Congress who was working with Russian church records. And he says, I want to find as much information on my true father, Count, they call him Count for some reason, Joseph Zubov. I was at his deathbed in Seattle, 1911. So he admits it. I want to know more about my father. So, I mean, you could write a whole novella about this. So he's, he identifies both sides of his family. Anyways, some of these pictures are well known. This has been used in lots of books, including De Laguna. But with Harold's help, you know, Harold identified every single clan house. So this is wonderful. Um, this is an example that the Sobolev nephew says, Salmon Dance House. Of course, it's not a dance house. It's a clan house of the Dog Salmon Clan, Walter Sobolev's clan. Killer Whale Chasing Seal. Harold helped me identify all the three men, English and Tlingit names. Uh, but then we have this. The, the, man on the, the young boy on the left is Robert Willard. Very well known Tlingit, future leader of the Wushkitan. And this is the kind of picture that you could put on the cover because it's very powerful. And he's a handsome guy. You could sort of do an enlargement. It's beautiful. The one on the right is poor quality, but these two boys are wearing very important regalia. The one with the raven on the right is the same one that Kichnav wears, so they're probably Deshitan. So, I mean, there's a lot of information here. This is the famous Gillis no Jake. He liked to be photographed. Every visiting photographer photographed him. But Vincent photographed him indoors inside his house, his meaning Kichnal's house. So this is valuable because you could see that he had some very modern um, furnishings. He's got all, you know, he liked wearing various European and native regalia, including military uniforms. He's showing his, this is not a coffin, if you're wondering. He's showing his Chilkat blanket. He has a young wife. Remember, if you, if you attended my lecture on, on my paper on Wednesday, he had a young wife wearing a Chilkat blanket or some native attire. Here she's got this lovely dress, and this is his daughter. And here he is with a Russian deacon named Harlampi Sokolov. And there are more pictures of him with this guy who was Russian. And he lets him wear some very precious Tlingit at U. And in my book published in 1999, I already talked about this guy who was bilingual Tlingit. He was an interpreter in the church. 
born before the sale of Alaska, and the Russian church accused him of, um, he, he, A, he liked to drink, and he would hang out with Plinkett. One Russian priest accused him of participating in potlatches and even cremation ceremonies. So he was a kind of, he was clearly bicultural, and a kind of a troublemaker, they called him, that he would criticize the church uh, among his Tlingit friends and so forth. But uh, some of the old timers knew, remembered him. Matthew Fred called, said, oh, Halampi. I remember hearing about Halampi. Um, Kajakti was a very prominent leader of Ankahitan. Uh, and this is a Vincent's attempt at a studio portrait he brings him to his house. This is Sobolev house. You can tell by the po painting, I mean the photographs of the Tsar. Interesting picture. Uh, that's a wonderful picture of the Basket Bay chief. And the Basket Bay uh, plan that Cyril George Dan Johnson, that, that family, they, they still have that hat, or maybe a version of that hat. But Harold, again, helped me identify some of the men, including, of course, the, the leader himself. A funeral scene, uh, Walter Sobolev recognized some of the men, including Kichnal himself is in the center wearing a hat, third from the right. This is a group of men from Sitka, actually, uh, raising a memorial stone, a funeral sto uh, gravestone for a Deshitan Ravenside uh, man from, two men from uh, Angoon. So there's a lot of information here. Um, and I'm, I'm wrapping it up, but there also, uh, the book will include ordinary kinds of activities and it's not going to be just about uh, Tlingit ceremonial life. Uh, for example, this woman on the roof, uh, on the front, she's drying seaweed. Just interesting things that uh, be of interest to people doing subsistence or just flinket readers, right? Herring eggs. So this is in Kilisno there. Kilisno was occupied only during spring and summer when the company was employing people to fish, cut wood, um, and of course, all the families moved except for old people who stayed behind in, in Angoon in the clan houses. This is what the church looked like, it's very lovely. And the famous picture of the church society. If you remember that handsome young man, Robert Willard, wearing the blanket. Now he's a little older, that debonair guy with, with the umbrella, the young man, second from the right on the front. And the young boy is um, Cyril uh, Sobolev Zubov. And there are other men that, between Walter Sobolev and Lydia George and Harold, we identified quite a few of these men. And that's the church society. And the picture is definitely in Angu, and we can tell by the, by the houses. Huh? Uh, church school with the priest and uh, the only Caucasian individual is the young church psalm reader and school teacher, Vasily Larionov, who I know through the church records, he couldn't make ends meet being the church helper. So you see him here. He joined the American uh, factory workers and he's playing his guitar. And uh, Walter said, don't remember Vasily, but I remember William Larionov. He was a joyful fellow, played the guitar. Here he is. So you have this transition of these Russian-American Creole guys into sort of dropping their Russian church identity and becoming more American. And this is a really interesting, especially for some of you who are doing, you know, this era of um, Tlingit art for tourists. Because Kilisno was on the, uh, in the summer, uh, big boats did come in to, uh, to look at the factory, bring mail, but also purchase some items, and so this lady whose name we don't know, she's weaving and she's got her items for sale. This lady is selling berries, I don't know, to visitors or maybe to Sobolevs. Um, she wouldn't be selling berries to Kilsno, Tlingit family. 
And this fellow, I mean, he's dressed very well. I, I'm sure he's waiting for people getting off the ship to buy his little totem poles. But he's got a nice dance paddle, right? And he's carving it. Oops. I don't know why this didn't show up. There, I have a few more images. Okay, and then a lot of pictures of, of fishing boats and Tlingit's fishing. And I like this picture, not so much for the giant halibut, but uh, on that boat, there's a Tlingit man, a Filipino man, and three Caucasian guys. So a very ethnically mixed crew, which I think is fascinating. Uh, lots of pictures of factory, you know, dead whales, I mean, you could have I mean, if people are doing economic history of Kilsnu, there's lots of stuff there. And Stephen Chernoff, who was an engineer, it was sort of the, the more upper level of the Creole families from Sitka. Most of the men from Sitka would come to work and then go back to Sitka. But these are descendants of uh, Russian families. And this is it. Uh, I apologize for running over, but I thought the material is so fascinating that um, kind of goes in different directions and just by doing this I decided the next project that I want to do is the history of the Russian families or Creole families in Sitka between 1867 and 1930. Sort of what happens to those people who stayed behind and most of them were not really Russian, they were Lutik Aleut, that group of people who had Russian last names and they were right in between the Americans and the Tlingits in, in Sitka. Very interesting. So I want to thank the, the folks like Walter and Harold and Jim, Jim's predecessor, Glady Copeland, but also the elders who are not here. And without them, this would not be possible. The project would be so much less, much less uh, substantial, much poorer. Uh, I'll take maybe one question, but we can talk outside also afterwards because I do did go over quite a bit. But maybe one question that somebody has or a comment. Yeah. I was um, wondering how the photographs circulated. Were they just did they stay in the family? Those with the solos, or did they did any of them go to uh, the Clinket families in the area? Were they sold as postcards? I mean, how did they? Uh, I found out, I didn't know this, but Vincent did make a few postcards. They were colored. But I think most of them just stayed. I mean, the, until Kinky Bears found the plates, they didn't really circulate much. He, I think he thought of himself mainly as an amateur, not, not a professional. I mean, his main thing was his business. Our next paper is by Harold Jacobs, who just flew in, or swam in, or crawled in, um, and Steve Hendrickson. And they don't need an introduction. Everybody knows them. Their paper is entitled Using Historical Photographs in Historical Research and Repatriation. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, this will be an interesting program, because Harold hasn't actually seen the program yet. so. <laughs> Uh, he may have a few surprises. Actually, uh, he he did. Harold did submit um, a number of these photos to me, and I've I've sort of organized them, and hopefully that'll all make sense in the end. But uh, um, as for myself, I, I find historical photos to be extremely useful in my work at the State Museum, as it um, in, involves uh, working with the Klingit culture and uh, learning about and documenting various uh, historical and, and contemporary practices and finding historical photos that illustrate some of these things and also some of the artifacts is one of the most enjoyable parts of, of my job and, uh, and it adds a lot in the museum to our educational work there to put context to uh, put the objects in context and uh, over the years we've found made some pretty amazing discoveries and I'll have to say that Harold is a master when it comes to 
finding uh, photos of, of specific artifacts and some of these historical photos, uh, the photos are so detailed that you can blow, blow them up and pretty much to life size in some cases and you can see just about every bead on a piece of beadwork or every, uh, every woven stitch in a Chilkat robe and it really makes it possible to identify specific objects with a great deal of accuracy. And the photos that we're going to present today will illustrate some of the things that uh, have been found over the years and I give a lot of credit to Harold for making some pretty miraculous um, uh, discoveries. Uh, he's a real master at, at this kind of work so commend him for, for that. Harold, did you want to say anything? Or Okay, well, we'll just get right into it. There's a, a lot to talk about. I think uh, as useful as photographs are some of the illustrations from prior to the widespread use of photography in Alaska, like this sketch by Wasnazinski in the 1840s, and, and really illustrating um, an episode from a, 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 a funeral and uh, there, there's lots of references to what's going on in here in, in uh, the, uh, the t and these practices are still going on today, of course, but there's details in the photo that to um, someone interested in the art and, and material culture, they'll find a lot of interest in. There's tenaz, there's a chi Chinese chest, Chilkat robes, and a drapery of, uh, f of trade cloth draped across the top of the room, which is something I've, I've read about, but this is the earliest illustration I've seen of it. And also this is the earliest illustration that we have of button robes. There's always speculation, well, when were button robes, when did they come into play? And this is uh, probably one of the earliest, if not the earliest, depiction of button robes. And then uh, from a few decades later, this, this photograph shows up with uh, people who may be going uh, into, they may be part of a funeral, but they're, they're all have carrying staffs like many of the uh, people in that photograph. And Harold, just chime in here if you have anything you'd like to say. One of the, the things that you'll find in, when you start working in archives is that there, there are multiple copies of the same image in a lot of different places and sometimes if you keep looking you'll find a larger version of the photo that that uh, has additional details that allows you to see where it is and, and I found one of this photo <clears throat> that shows what, what's beyond the margins and, and one of the block houses in Sitka was cropped out of this particular image so there it helps you uh, you know identify the the location and there's uh, scenes like this. Now, another thing with the photographs, sometimes the same photo is attributed to different photographers, and I think there was a lot of piracy going on of each other's images. I have, I've seen a photo very similar to this that was attributed to MNs, and I think Case and Draper or Winter and Pawn also used it, but uh, regardless of who took it, it's really a, a great image of a, uh, Emmons said this was uh, people coming into Sitka for a berry feast and they've unrolled bolts of cloth, colored cloth, and stretch it from bow to stern on the canoe uh, in a kind of a rainbow-like pattern. And that's something that it must be a, uh, an earlier practice that I, at least I haven't heard of this being done in recent times. And of course there is um, this rich resource relating to the 1904 potlatch and that's something that uh, I know Harold has done an incredible amount of work with these photos identifying many of the people in them and, and also locating many of these objects where, where they are today. Some are still with the clans and others have ended up in museums. This photo was taken by E.W. Merrill in December 1904. My grandmother remembered going to Sitka and I lost it again. There it is. About 1903 when they were planning for this potlatch, I'll call it, she remembered traveling by canoe. <clears throat> she was baptized in St. Michael's Orthodox Cathedral on March 10th, 1903. 
she figured she was about three or four years old then, but they put that down as her birth date. Her father is in this picture, I'll get to him in a little bit. We were able to get most of the people identified in this picture. This is George Johnson, Koshachau from the Raven House, Peter Dick, Katina from the Basket Bay Arch House, Jimmy Hansen, Kwas Ish from the Steel House, Little Jack, Wolf Shuk from the Freshwater Spring House, Larry Jackson, Kisht from the Killer Whale House, Yaxlahat, Tekwedi from the Bear House, Tom Phillips, Deik Da from Sitka, he's from the Strong House, Mary, Mary Jones, Kau, Sam Johnson, Kasha, Sam Johnson's Ayach from the Raven House, Yesk from the Steel House, Kachutwat from the End of the Trail House, Kutla'a from the Fort House, this is Charlie John, Tuk from the uh, House Standing Sideways, Peter Johnson, Ancheska from the Raven Bones House, and I lost it again. This belongs to the Duck Tlaweo. This is Billy Jones on Gushu from the Raven Bones House as well. My mother, grandmother, Annie Jacobs, this is her father, John Paul Kotlin. He was married to the daughter of this man, my great-great-grandfather, Dick Yishnawu, and he was married to the daughter of this man, Kellis New Jake. So this is my great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, and great-great-great-grandfather standing together. 1985, this was, like, maybe this was the first clinket item to be returned. Nagpur hadn't been passed. It was five years before Nagpur. This is the dragonfly headdress. It came up for sale in New York, and uh, I contacted the collector and was able to arrange a private collector to pay for the purchase of this. He agreed to put up half the purchase price, and then he put up the entire price and donated it. This headdress and this one were in the National Museum of the American Indian. They've been returned. This is also being returned to the clan. Deshitan items, this gungoosh and this headdress here. This is in the Portland Art Museum. This is in the Seattle Art Museum. I looked all over for this song leader staff. Every museum I went to, I'd look in their pile of sticks, literally standing in corners and hoping to come across this one and then this one is in the, it came out at a party one time. I walked by the table and there it was laying out on the potlatch in Angoon. I, ah. you know, I was just speechless looking at it. For years I didn't know it was still on clinking hands. This shirt was my grandfather's. This was from the Needlefish House and it got sold in 1975. It was just returned a couple of years ago under Nagpra. There's other pictures of it being worn. A lot of these objects are still in clan hands, like this hat that's called a tsayisach. You see in trees in the winter time and they have a sheltered area under them where no snow falls. That's what this hat refers to. A raven hat. This headdress is still in Angoon. Beaver hat. This is in front of the Wolf House in Sitka. That's also called the uh, Eagle House. The house off to the side is also a Wolf House that was also known as the World House and the Noble House. So out of this picture, we were able to put in, use in successful claims, one, two, three, Four, five, I 
forgot about this song leader staff. That was just returned. Six. Seven. Objects with claims pending on these two objects. Uh, <clears throat> I also wanted to mention about this. Uh, Cecilia Kunz's father, Jake Yaquan, was one of the the uh, Kaguan Town Wolf House hosts of this particular party, and uh, there are an, in a number of photos of this uh, event as well as other uh, other ceremonies. Sometimes there are people wearing their Chilkat robes upside down with the fringe up, and there's a couple people in this one that way. And I asked Cecilia if she if she had an idea why they did that, and she said that that means that something big was about to happen. And I also asked some other people about it too, and one person said that that was a, a sign of distress or protest because this potlatch was, uh, they call it the last potlatch because this was Governor Brady's decree that this be the last potlatch and it was to pay off all remaining debts and then that would be it and that was a, this was a form of protest. Uh, uh, Harold, can you say anything about the uh, that large, I guess, for lack of a better term, uh, marionette or puppet? This is a dragonfly. The dragonfly is one of the crests of the Deshitan. They made this for when they entered the house. There was a man inside moving the head. I believe that was Peter Tom Noska and one of the men under the left wing, which is on the right side of the picture, was Jimmy George from Angoon. I don't remember who they said the other person moving the other wing was. But they didn't think this would go over too good, but apparently it was a big hit at the party. A dragonfly is seen on that and also on the front row, the second from the left is Peter Dick wearing a shirt with a dragonfly on it and then next to him is Jimmy Hansen wearing the dragonfly headdress. See, that's what I like about Harold. Not only does he know who is in the photo, but he can tell who's not in the photo but is just hidden behind the dragonfly's wing or inside the house. This is a, a photo of some, uh, there's a series of photos of um, a ceremonial event in, in Kluckwan or up, up in the Chilkat Valley and these are some canoes of guests coming in and um, I thought this was interesting as it, uh, I, pertaining to my interest in, in armor, uh, I was always told by people that a potlatch was a time of, of peace where uh, Clan, different clans come together and, and it's uh, all meant to be a peaceful situation and uh, and yet in some of these uh, photos there are people carrying guns and even sometimes wearing pieces of armor and in this particular photo there's a, could I have one of the, this particular photo this man right here is wearing a shark war helmet and holding a rifle and a couple other people have rifles but uh, I think this may relate to when the, the guests arrive uh, and they're challenged. The hosts come out of their houses and and uh, they go through a welcoming ritual where they ask the people to, you know, say, they say in essence, halt who goes there and there's kind of a, a atmosphere of, you know, being ready for a fight if that was the case, even though everyone knows that it's it's not a, uh, not that kind of a situation at all, but that, that may be a possible explanation for why there are guns and, and armor here. But that particular helmet, I believe, is this one that ended up in the Field Museum that has a, it's a shark dogfish with a frog coming out of its mouth. Uh, in looking at historical photos to allow us to visualize the, the, the setting of the different uh, the different towns in southeast Alaska, the way they were uh, prior to f uh, photography, and some of the earliest photos that we have show the traditional style of, of uh, 
plank house, the the houses built with uh, house posts with beams across them and the, then split planks that, that cover it. This is Sitka uh, right along the wall where the Russians built uh, palisades and, and block houses there. This is a, a photo that ended up in the uh, Beinecke Library at Yale. It's the only photo that I've seen of a Klingit house under construction and it shows the process of raising one of the roof beams up on top of a of a house post and there's a, a whole line of people pulling on a rope there and, and uh, one guy that's standing near the top of the post ready to I guess put some chocks in there once the beam is raised and set on top of the post but it doesn't look like a it looks like a pretty precarious perch up there. I'm not sure which community this is. Some people thought Sitka, others thought maybe Klukwan. And uh, photography inside was, you know, an extremely challenging due to the lighting conditions. And there are uh, some really interesting photos of the inside of houses. This one is in Sitka, and it, it uh, shows a relatively small house with uh, that's uh, excavated down one step, and then the fireplace in the middle, and people's. Uh, uh, this is their household, and they're doing some cooking over the fire there. It's really uh, pretty amazing to see these images since they are so rare. Just want to comment about the structure around the edge. The edge was called Tog, and uh, they slept in these according to their rank. Uh, equal rank people slept on the levels closer to the fire, and the lower the rank, the further away from the fire they were. There was an old man in Angoon that was testifying at court, and they asked the judge asked him, "Do you know the woman on the stand here?" And he said, "Oh yeah, I know her. We sleep on the same board." <laughs> he was referring to them being of equal rank, but it sounded funny to the judge. Well, if any of you were at the the uh, welcome ceremony the other night, um, the the room was meant to be arranged a, as it would be in a clan house, where uh, people would be seated around the perimeter along that ledge and standing in the back, and then the main activity around the fire in the center. Do you want to talk about this? These are some of the clan houses in Angoon. They're wraps around the edge of the village. This is on uh, Isthmus, and that's what the name Angoon means, Angoon, the town on the Isthmus. The house on the very end is Deshu Hit, the end of the trail house, Yesh Hit, the raven house, Tukka Hit, the needlefish house, Steen Hit, the steel house, Goon Hit, the freshwater spring house, Teak Hit, also called Anchak Hit, the center of town house or dog salmon house. Chutz Hit, the bear house. Keet Hit, which is my father's house, the killer whale house, and then the house next to that. Also a killer whale house, but often referred to as the killer whale chasing seal house, or it's Ayayanas Nak Keet Hit. In this picture is the bear pole that was repatriated from the University of Northern Colorado in Greeley about five years ago. This is a, a photo from Cluck One, and it the I think this is in the McBride Museum, and they say this is this may be the frog house there, the Gunnectady Frog House, and that would make a certain amount of sense due to the the grave structure behind, with uh, one of which has a carving of a frog emerging um, on it. So that could very well be the the right identification of it. It's really interesting to to see this the. The period that photography came to Southeast Alaska was this period where the traditional structure of the house was transitioning to the Western style. Yet, uh, even even though it may look like a, a an American style house from the outside, many of these houses had a big 
open room on the lower level that that could, uh, um, ceremonial gatherings could still take place. They no longer had a fire pit in the middle, but but still they still functioned as a, a clan house. And these are just a few photos of the of the interior of the frog house that I worked with a few years ago when we were redoing the exhibits at the museum, and we happened to have these original frog house posts on loan from the Gunnachtady frog house people, uh, and they were going to hang on to them until they uh, complete their cultural center in Klukwan. But uh, we wanted to redo our exhibits to more closely resemble what the inside of the frog house once looked like. And we interviewed um, uh, elders, especially Mary King was really instrumental in helping us visualize what this was like. And of course, uh, that um, added a lot, uh, adding a lot to her account were these early photos of the frog house uh, before, when it was the traditional style you can see in, uh, in one of the photos there, you can actually see the, the house beam uh, sitting up near the top of it. And, and so this was a, a sign that we we're dealing with a traditional style house. There's a set of older house posts uh, in that house too at the time uh, that are sitting right next to the frog house posts. You notice here that these are, you don't really see a lot of obvious paint there, although I think they probably were painted but in the next photo, the, the painting really stands out. And sometime around the turn of the century, Mary King said the, the old house was torn down, a new one put up, a new one in the Western style. You can see the two by fours or the sawn lumber there in the, the ceiling. And they also repainted the house post uh, so that they'd look nice in the new, the new house. And they're, they're together here with the with a screen, and even though it's a more modern version of a house, it has a, a wood stove in the center of the room instead of an open fire, and it still has a retaining plank around there to make kind of a ledge that goes around the perimeter of the, of the room. And uh, this is a, a photo that uh, uh, is extremely rare, showing a, a actual, it says dance, uh, Dance of the Sticks at the Kluckwan Potlatch, October uh, 18th, 98. It's a Pillsbury photo. And this one, uh, in, in some of the versions of this, you can actually see one of the frog house posts right up there, just barely in the photo. Sometimes that's cropped out, and that's why you should look at every version of photo that you see so that, uh, oh, so that you can uh, pick out some of those details. We used this photo in a repatriation claim as well. That blanket right there was repatriated. It was sold around 1974 and it was just repatriated two years ago. This was one of the photos that was used in the repatriation claim. That blanket actually should be out tomorrow during our NAGPRA session. So we have to speed through the rest of these. We're running short on time, but this is another, in the back of the background of this, the frog house post shows up again, and that's the only way to identify what house this is, but this is, uh, shows a couple of Chilkat robes being woven and, and uh, furs on the line to dry out after a trapping expedition. This is the resulting exhibit at the State Museum, and I was really happy when Mary King came to see it finally, and she, wa she was really moved by it and said it, this is exactly like her elders told her that it used to be. So I thought uh, with her help and the photos, it really worked out well together. And now just a, a few case studies of, of some of the things that, that have come up. This was a, a beaded neck piece that showed up at an auction uh, not too long ago, and I called Harold and asked him about um, if he knew what clan it was, and he said, you know, it looked familiar, and he was thinking about it, and the auction was going to happen the next day, and I went ahead and bid on it for the State Museum, and we, we got the auction, and then the next day I had an email from Harold that said, guess what? <laughs> he had that, that was the title of it, and as soon as I saw that, I knew what had, had happened. He had identified what clan this was from, and so we, we quickly undid 
uh, our our bid and the the clan ended up being able to buy this this one back. Now, can you say something about this photo, Harold? This is Alex Andrews from Sitka. He is from the he was the house master of the Eagle Nest House and one of the clan leaders of the Kogwan town. If you listen to the talk on the Russian, the battle with the Russians, that uh, book the Downhowers did, Alex Andrews was one of the people who contributed to the, his story was transcribed and is recorded in that book. There's the, there's the full, the full photo uh, that that was taken from. So sometimes you have to enlarge these uh, pretty high. Whoops. Uh, I, I thought I saw this same neck piece in another photo, and uh, Jim Smart was good enough to, this, this version is on Vilda, and Jim emailed me a higher resolution version, which is here, and I'm pretty confident that that's the same, the same one. It's, uh, you can sometimes get a fair amount of detail, but uh, it's uh, it's really interesting and fun actually to try to find locate some of these things in the photos. I'm sorry we have to we're going to have to move move right along here to try to uh, stay on time. But uh, there's a uh, in in the 1904 potlatch photos again. There's a lot of uh, so hundreds of of objects and and find it's they they're always turning up. It seems there's a man here wearing a a uh, uh, it looks like it could be a frog, perhaps. I'm not sure what crest it is. This, he's wearing a mask in this shot, but uh, that one, what's that? There's a picture of the of the shirt. How many of you were in the last session when I was in over here? Anybody there? Because this is the wolf hat that we had out. This was taken in the eight, I believe eight, late 1890s. The uh, only item we have in here is actually the wolf hat, and then um, off to the side is the hat called the Box of Daylight that belongs to our opposites, the Ishkaton. When a clan member would die, it was customary for the in-laws to put their object out to show they were standing behind the clan in the time of death. This headdress came up for auction in 2005 and the woman who bought it called our office, actually called Bill Holm and then Bill Holm contacted us and asked if we wanted it back and we were able to return this to the proper clan. The frame is gone, but when they get that put back together and have a party, they'll make an announcement, I guess, I hope. Is it, uh the uh, inside of the uh, Nanyai, uh, is it the Bear House in Wrangell? Mud Shark House, with all the Ut U. This robe was just returned to Wrangell last November. This was in the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, as well as the hat. That was a hat that came from my father's family. 1991, a friend called me and said he was in the museum and looking through objects and he noticed a garbage bag on the floor. He asked what was in it and they opened it and it was that killer whale hat. And he called me and he said, oh, the museum said, oh, they're going to want it back. He, yep. <laughs> Hang on. Speak of Bill Holm, we have a paper by Bill Holm coming up. Okay, let's, uh, I guess we'll have to end it here since we're running late. Um, but we, uh, at, at any rate, we, we really have found these historical photos to be quite useful in this work, and uh, we'd be happy to talk more about the processes uh, after the after this, uh, session. Thank you very much. I apologize for um, being tough when I wasn't as tough with my own paper, but 
as we learn in these clan conferences, respect for our elders is a number one Tlingit virtue. And so we learn from our Tlingit brothers and sisters. So to show respect to our elder Bill Holm, we give him equal time. And his paper is called, Old Photos Might Not Lie, But They Fib A Lot About Color. Please welcome Bill Holm. Old photos might not lie, but they fib a lot about color for the Northwest Coast. We all know that old photographs hold a cargo of valuable information about the tra traditions of the coast people, their lives and customs, as well as their arts. There's an old saying that photo photographs don't lie. Today it's common knowledge that they can lie a lot, even without photoshopping, as digital manipulation of photographic images is called. But long before photoshopping, photographs were telling little fibs about color. When photography first came on the scene, the techniques and materials left a lot to be desired. Photographic emulsions, that is the light sensitive materials that were used to produce an image, were very limited in their response to light. They were very slow, exposures taking a long time, and they responded to a very narrow range of wavelengths of light. The earliest ones, around the middle of the 19th century were not sensitive to colors in the red area of light, of the light spectrum. Red light didn't affect them at all. And uh, so red and, and related colors came out black in the finished print. Yellow was just about as bad and in the old mid 19th century photographs it printed as very dark gray, even black in some cases. On the other hand, the early emulsions were very sensitive to blue. So blue colors were printed as very light, even white. All other colors of light were affected by these biases, more or less depending on how close to red or blue they were. Gradually improvements in sensitivity were made so that these drastic alterations in what we expect a color value to be were less and less. Up until the beginnings of, the, of 35 millimeter photography, many Roll films were a little sensitive to red light, allowing the use of a little red transparent window in the back of the camera to be able to read the number of the exposure. Those films were called orthochromatic, or true colors. The modern films, sensitive pretty much across the spectrum, were called panchromatic, or all colors. So an old 19th century photo will usually render reds and yellows darker than we expected, and blues as lighter than we expect. And remember the rule. Blues go light, reds and yellows go dark. The problem is much less for Northwest Coast material than for objects from the plains or plateau. And I'm going to use a few pieces from those areas because they offer good examples. There's also a lot more photographs of beadwork from earlier times than most of the Northwest Coast photos. And so the uh, films uh, show these differences much greater in the old plains photographs. <clears throat> Here's a row of beadwork using a variety of colors that were common to old beadwork. The middle row is shown in natural color. The upper row is photographed with modern panchromatic film and the lower row with old time blue sensitive film. I'll use the term film for all examples even though the early photographs were made on metal or glass plates. Here you can compare the panchromatic image with the color example. Uh, that's the modern film. If you squint your eyes, you can see that the values are similar in the two uh, rows, although the upper row is just black, white, and various shades of gray, and the lower row is actually color. So I want you to all take a look at that. In this picture, the lower row was photographed with blue sensitive film, like the old time film. Here you will see some obvious differences. Blues have gone light, reds and yellows dark, according to the rule. Some blues have become white, reds black, and yellows and oranges black or dark gray. So just compare those two for a moment and you'll see how this could affect the appearance of colors in old photographs. Uh, here's a picture of an Omaha man wearing an otter fur turban headdress and a long uh, ribbon work uh, pendant, which is actually the tail of the otter. 
and he's got beaded leggings on, and all these things can be compared. But let's take a look at a comparison with the uh, otter skin headdress. <clears throat> this picture is the tail, uh, the upper picture is the tail of the otter skin that's been made into a turban headdress. The decoration is ribbon work, silk ribbon that's been sewn in patterns on the tail. If you don't know about the rule, it would be hard to believe that these two pictures are of the same object. In the lower picture, the detail of the old um, photograph of the Omaha man wearing the headdress, you can see that the red area in the center has gone darker than any other color, while the light blue shapes are now white, and the orange areas are nearly as dark as the very dark blues. So just take a moment to look at that and compare the two and see how much we can be confused by old photographs that are using a blue, blue sensitive films. The old photograph on the left is of the Blood Indian Chief Red Crow, shows him wearing a shirt that is now in the British Museum. Here the blue beaded strip with light yellow diamonds you see over his shoulder <clears throat> has reversed in value with the yellow diamonds appearing as dark on a white background. Whereas in the, in the photograph in color on the right uh, side, you'll see that it is really a, sort of a middle value blue with light yellow diamonds. The dark blue pattern on the light blue, blue rosette on the chest has almost disappeared. This is partly due to the fact that it is brightly lighted, but in fact that dark blue uh, barely shows up uh, from, uh, as a result of this uh, blue sensitive film. The flathead chief, Lewison, was photographed by Edward Curtis wearing a painted buffalo robe with a beaded strip. The strip is still around and you can see a detail of it in the lower uh, center. The background of the rosettes is yellow and of the rectangular panels is blue. In Curtis' picture, the blue has gone white and the yellow dark. The lower pictures show this strip is photographed in color in pan film and in blue sensitive film. The most striking feature is the band with yellow and dark blue triangles. What, you got some pointer or some way I can point to that? Right here. And you see in the pan film on the, on the left, uh, the yellow and blue show and the values such as we might expect them. And on the blue sensitive film, it turns into a dark gray band or in the Curtis picture, a black band. So uh, if we look at old photographs, unless you understand that, you might look at this and say it can't be the same piece because where are those uh, blue and, uh, dark blue and yellow triangles? <clears throat> One of the crow men in this 1890s photograph by Frank J. Haynes holds a tomahawk pendant. He's holding it upside down because it was separate from the tomahawk at the time that may have belonged to the photographer. It's now in the Haynes Collection at the Montana Historical Society Museum. Now, there are a lot of pieces in this uh, photograph that we could compare, but because we happen to have this particular piece still in existence, it's nice to make the comparison. Here's the same tomahawk pendant. The center picture is as it appears today. On the left is a panchromatic photograph as we expect it to appear in a modern photo. The black and white image looks believable. But the blue sensitive photo on the right has distorted the color values. The light blues have gone white. The dark blues have lightened, so they bl blend with the yellow areas that have darkened. So this might, you might not believe that's the same piece unless you are able to understand this, this principle. <clears throat> now let's go to the Northwest Coast. Here it's also the beadwork that gives us the best examples of the color problem. There are lots of old photographs of Tlingit beadwork being worn, and we've just seen some, and some were great examples of what I'm talking about. The problem is finding matches between old photographs and the same pieces today. There are some, though, and this picture of a Tlingit man includes a great example. You see he has a beaded collar there. Well, here he is on the left. On the, in the center is a color photograph of the same collar. On the right is a panchromatic. Uh, film image of the same one. You can see how the blue sensitive film has distorted the values. In this color, the red background has gone dark, while the blues have whitened. The yellow ears and the crescent reliefs in the eye have almost disappeared. 
take a moment to look at that. The yellow tongue, which is almost invisible in the picture, has darkened and shows clearly. The yellow circles in the frog's feet are light value in the panchromatic image and very dark in the blue sensitive film. Without understanding these distortions, it would be hard to believe that these are the same piece. Here's a fine octopus bag in the Sheldon Jackson Museum. I won't uh, bother to explain all the changes as they're the same as we've seen in the previous example. Just remember, blues go light, reds and yellows go dark. But just take a moment to look at that and compare them in your own mind. Some designs will disappear completely. Some will just seem opposite of what they should be. Here, the most striking changes are in the contrast between the blue tunic and its red facings. Their values have been reversed. The expected changes in the values of the beadwork are also seen here. There are many old photos of Northwest Coast people in ceremonial dress. The color value distortion shown here is greater than many examples as photographic emulsions varied in the late 19th century. A photograph may show as radical a change as here or a very slight distortion in the values. But uh, it, you can imagine that if you saw the lower left-hand picture, uh, you might not expect that it would be the, the tunic that you see in the upper one because of the reversal of the color values. Here's another tunic with red and dark blue reversed in the blue sensitive version. Beadwork also changes values. Um, the blue area seems darker than the red as we might expect in the uh, panchromatic film. But uh, in the uh, old blue sensitive film it just uh, completely reverses our expected values. Another example uh, showing the same kind of distortion where the, the uh, red areas have gone black or dark and the blue areas have, and that's a dark blue tunic and yet look how much it has lightened up with the old blue sensitive film. And here's a simple applique design in red and dark blue that makes a startling transformation when photographed on blue sensitive film. Even the yellowish buckskin fringes have darkened. Just compare those two lower ones and see how different they look, and yet they are both photographs of the same piece using the two different kinds of uh, film. We saw a couple of images of the upper photograph uh, today already <coughs> of the chief sheikhs lying in state with the Chilkat blanket uh, on the wall behind him and the killer whale hat behind him. Um, the lower picture shows the killer whale hat in uh, color on panchromatic film on one side and the blue sensitive film on the other. Notice how the blue colors have gone really light, almost white, in the, in the Chief Shakes picture they've gone white, and the red lips and other red details have gone black. So we, we know if we can expect to see this, we can oftentimes identify a piece that we otherwise might not see. Now, when, uh, we see a lot of Chilkat robes in the um, old photographs, and they vary in the, in the effect of this uh, old-fashioned blue-sensitive film. This 19th century photograph of a Tlingit lady is a good example of value distortion in the yellow areas of a Chilkat robe. The yellow border and the joint sockets appear black, while the blue spaces are very light, almost white. And so we look at the borders of that Chilkat blanket, and we might say, wait a minute, that supposed to be a black border with a yellow inner border, but they must have been black borders in the olden days. Well, this is a standard Chilkat robe in color, and that yellow has gone as dark as the black. In this series of photographs of a Chilkat robe, the yellows have gone fully black, giving the design a completely different, heavier appearance than that in the panchromatic photo at the right. Notice the black band across the central face, for example, uh, contrasting with the white background. And it's yellow in the upper photograph, it's black in the lower left hand, and white in the, or very light color in the right hand photo. So uh, you have to now remember the rule. 
Simple rule in old blue sensitive photographs. Blues go light, reds and yellows go dark. Thank you. Any questions to uh, Bill Holm? That's a question. Bill. Katie. Bill. There's Katie right there. What's the general time period when people start to use the different films? The general time period. Um, well, in the earliest photographs in the mid-19th century, they were all this way. But as the uh, photography was improved and uh, film emulsions were improved, they gradually began to get better. So by the 1880s and 1890s, um, we saw a little bit of improvement, especially in the yellows. The red still continued to go dark. Right up to the 20th century, reds were still going dark. As I mentioned, we used to, uh, we used to um, process our films under a red safe light. And you could go like this in the, in the developer and watch the image appear and be able to see it because the film wasn't sensitive to the red light. But uh, certainly by the 1920s, it was pretty much solved. But in the old photographs, like the ones we've been seeing, often the yellows show pretty well as being light or middle value because the yellow sensitivity was being improved. So I would say... Uh, up until the 1890s, 1880s, or 1890s, you'd almost always see this effect. And into the beginning of the 20th century, you'd see some of it. Another question. What film is the best today? What film is the best to use today? <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm not up on it. We're not using film much anymore. Uh, but uh, any film called panchromatic is, is sensitive to the broad range of colors. And so uh, you can look, and if it says pan or pan chromatic film, that's usually the best. When you go to another museum, to a different museum, you want to photograph object. What do you use? Well, if I'm, I use pan. <laughs> if I'm using black and white film, which I'm not anymore, because I'm using a digital camera. <laughs> uh, and by the way, uh, digital cameras are are organized or built so that they photograph like pan chromatic film. But, uh, you know, uh, maybe the film doesn't lie, but the computer can. And you can make that, those darks and lights any way you want them. I don't, I don't know. I'm not much of an expert on that part. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. I think if we learn something, among other things at this conference, that Bill Holm can still teach us so much at his age. And... I mean, how many papers he's given, how much he's taught us. So I'd like to give him another round of applause. And I thought it was very appropriate that the first article on the uh, conference in the Juno Empire was Bill uh, was on the cover uh, with a nice picture there. So as a, one of the symbols of the Klan conference.